I'm so grateful for the generosity. We're sitting in the sacrifice of so many people. We're sitting in a debt-free building. Praise God. Can we just thank God? And I'm thankful for this church. You know, when you, when you go through seasons of life that aren't easy and you go through times that you don't always have everything that you would want, it makes you really grateful for what you do have makes you really grateful for what you can use. I, I know there's been times in my life, probably in your life, where maybe, maybe you got hurt or injured. You weren't able to uh, use a certain part of your body. And it, and it makes you think about, man, I'm so grateful for when I can use that part of my body. And, you know, I was thinking about one of my friends. He's one of the most thankful guys I know. His name is Emeka Nanka. And Emeka, he's been coming to this church now for almost 10 plus years. He comes in here every Sunday in his wheelchair. And you know what? One day Emeka is going to walk. But those of you that know Emeka, you know who I'm talking about. An incredible football player. Played football in, in the semi-pro uh, league here in Tulsa. And got injured from the neck down. But man, he is so thankful. He's always talking about what he's thankful for. And it kind of just checks you to make sure, man, have I been that grateful? Have I gotten into a complaining mentality? Do I spend more time complaining about what I don't like in my life or in, in my family? Or, or do I spend more time talking about how grateful I am that I can have a family, that I can go to church, that I can walk, that I can see and I can hear? And I just think going into this Thanksgiving, I want to challenge us to be the most thankful bunch of people. I already think victory is the cream of the crop in, in, in the world. I think y'all are the best church in the world. But what if we took it up a notch and we just, we were the first ones to give thanks at Thanksgiving this week. What if we were the first ones at our job this week to talk about how grateful we are to have a job. How grateful we are to work somewhere. How grateful we are to live in a nation where we can still worship the Lord freely. How grateful we are for, for, for what we do have. Maybe you don't have a car. Maybe you have a bike. Maybe you don't have the nicest car, but you do have a car. Maybe you don't have a job, but you have a, a, a family. You have something to be thankful for, well, why don't we just give thanks to God right now? Just thank God that you're alive, you're well, you're here today at church, the best church in the world. I think so. But you know, we've got always something to be thankful for. And this morning, if you have a Bible, just lift it up while you're standing. Open to Matthew 6. We're going to stand and read the word together. Come on, let's celebrate that we have Bibles. And if you don't have a Bible, we'd love to bless you with one at the end of service, right down here at the altar call. We believe that this word is the inspired word of God, and it gives us life, it gives us direction, salvation, freedom. And it's not the book that gives us salvation, it's the man that's found in the book. His name is Jesus Christ. But Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 says, Our Father in heaven, may your kingdom, may your name be kept holy. Hallowed be your name. This is the Lord's Prayer. Jesus is teaching His disciples to pray. He says, May your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus was telling them, Don't wait till you get to heaven to let heaven invade your lives here on earth. Last week, we spent some good time in heaven. How many of y'all were here when we kind of took a trip to heaven? If you weren't here, you got to get the CD. It was wild. It was different. I've never done that before. I've never been in a service where we've done that before. I was listening to it again this week just thinking, wow, we spent 18 minutes thinking about what it would look like to be in heaven. Somebody told me, Paul, can we, can we do that every week? <laughs> they were like, can you take us on another trip to heaven? I said, no, we're still here on earth. Our job is to take that trip of heaven and bring it down here on earth while we're with our family, our friends, and bring as many people by the end of our life with us back to the real heaven after this life. Can I get an amen in the place this morning? Well, let's say this together. Say, I'm here on purpose because I have a purpose. My heart is open. My mind is ready to receive. Now, I want to add this in there. Say, my mind is sharp. I have the mind of Christ. I am focused today to receive from God. Because God's not finished with me yet. And my best days, say it with a little bit of attitude, my best days are right in front of me. And I have victory in my life 
because Jesus lives in me. Do you believe that victory? Lord, we thank you. We have victory through Jesus Christ. Lord, this morning, do what you want to do in this service. Holy Spirit, take over. God, let us experience the goodness and the grace and the kindness. And Lord, the challenging word that you want to give to us that's going to give us that, that peace this week and that strength this week to do what you've called us to do. Lord, that we would be about your kingdom this week, about your will being done. God, I thank you, Lord, that you're going to minister to the hearts of every person here today. Lord, help us to see Jesus, to hear Jesus, to feel Jesus like we already have in this place. God, just continue what you're doing in this service. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Give two people a high five as you're being seated. Thank you, Mark. Yes, we are a high-fiving, loving church. You know, when you get to thinking about heaven and you start thinking about things like what's after this life, in our bulletins we've been putting that scripture in there, James 4 verse 14 that says life is a vapor. We don't know when it's going to be gone. It's here today, gone tomorrow. It starts getting you to, to kind of think about how do I live my life? How am I living in light of eternity? One of the phrases we've been saying in this series is, what we do in this vapor of a life determines where and how we will spend eternity. What we do in this vapor of a life not only determines where we, but where others will spend eternity. See, our lives are connected to other people. They're watching us. They're listening to us. And we could be the link in the chain that's connecting somebody to Christ. So not only what do what we do in this life determines where we spend eternity, but it determines where others might spend eternity. And, and there's this phrase in the world that, that people use, and, and, and it's not a good phrase. It's a phrase, and, and they, I'm going to let you think about the word that's inserted there, but they say, give them blank, right? And what it means is to give someone pain, destruction, uh, 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 make them pay for what they did. Basically, the word is hell. They want you to kind of make them get revenge on the people who have hurt you. Put them through the worst of circumstances. Treat them like they deserve it. Give them what they deserve. And, you know, I was thinking, I was kind of reading, what does this phrase mean? Why do people say it? It's a phrase that's used in the world. It's a phrase that's used in sports games. We're going to give it to them. We're going to make them pay for what they did to us. And my dad, he always had a way of redeeming worldly phrases. He was always changing things. In our house, when my mom made deviled eggs, he called them angel eggs. Anybody else call them angel eggs? He was always changing things. It, it was always, you know, he would always try to put a heavenly spin on whatever it was that the world was trying to make about hell or about the devil. I'm grateful for that kind of a dad. Uh, but one of the things he used to tell me and John when we were caught in situations where maybe we were being bullied or mistreated or maybe things were happening to us that were unfair, unjust. Maybe it was something in school or maybe it was something with friends. He would tell us these words, Paul, Give them heaven. Give them heaven. Give them heaven. But dad, I want to give them the opposite. John, give them heaven. Give them heaven. I want you to turn to the per person next to you and say, give them heaven. The title of the message today is give them heaven. This week, no matter what people give you, what are we going to give them? Heaven. Give them heaven. You say, well, what does that even mean? Right? I mean, that's what I asked my dad. Dad, what does that mean? I understand you're trying to redeem the phrase that the world uses about hell, but what are you saying? He says, Paul, think about what heaven is. So I want us to think real quick. What is heaven? It's a place of no sorrow. It's a place of no sickness. It's a place where God's presence dwells. It's a place where Jesus sits at the right hand of God. It's a place of no complaining, only rejoicing, only worship. It's a place of no bitterness or unforgiveness, only mercy, only grace. It's a place where healing resides. It's a place where joy and peace and kindness and patience and all the fruits of the Spirit reside. There's no sin. There's no darkness. There's no addiction. There's no revenge. There's no strife. There's no slander. There's no gossip. And so when Dad says, give them heaven, what he was saying was, Treat them like Jesus. Show them a little taste of what heaven is like. 
And I was saying it earlier, right before we sat down and prayed. How people were saying, Paul, can we take more trips to heaven? I, I want to take a trip to heaven every week. I had so many people telling me that this week. There was so much pressure. I was kind of coming up to this week, and I was like, should I take them on another trip to heaven? And this is what God said to me. Paul, tell them to take heaven back to their family. Tell them to take heaven with them to Thanksgiving. Paul, you, you, you took them on an 18-minute trip to heaven. Tell them to take an 18-minute trip to heaven with their family this week. Show them what Jesus is like. You say, well, Paul, you don't understand. I, I have people in my family that just rub me the wrong way. I don't even want to go to my Thanksgiving dinner. I don't even want to be there. Don't raise your hand if that's you. <laughs> Paul, my in-laws, my sons, my daughters, my, their girlfriends and boyfriends, I don't even want to look at. I don't know what's wrong with my family, but I don't want to spend time. And God's saying, you've got to show them what Jesus is like. You might be the only person in their life that they're going to see that's going to show them what Jesus is like. You might be the only Jesus that someone sees this week. And I want to challenge you not just to take it to your family, but take it to the strangers in your life, to the people you encounter at Walmart, at Quick Trip, the people that may rub you the wrong way in traffic this week. Show them what Jesus is like, especially if you have a victory sticker on the bump of your car. <laughs> I want to tell you real quick, there's three things that try to hold us back from giving people heaven. There's three things that try to keep us from making the most of our time here on earth. If life is short, why not make the most of it by treating people right? And here's three things that try to hold us back. Number one, selfishness. Selfishness is basically a me, myself, and I mentality. I'm going to look out for me, myself, and I. I'm here to serve me. I'm here to make sure that my needs are met. And what happens is selfishness, it turns life all about us and it makes us be so it makes us miss out on what real life really is it causes us to miss out on the joy of serving the joy of giving yesterday I was at the Thanksgiving harvest feast and I was walking through the tables just shaking hands praying for people and this woman said can you get me some napkins I need some napkins like right now I said yes ma'am I'm here to serve so I went and found some napkins, brought them back, and next thing I know, a guy next to me, hey, I need some napkins too. I need some napkins too. Give me some napkins. And what happened was, when I went to go serve that woman, something changed. She was, at first, she was upset. It was all about her napkins. It was all about what she needed. But all of a sudden, when I gave her those napkins, I gave her a lot of napkins too, because I just wanted to bless that woman with as many napkins as she needed. <laughs> and... Uh, she looked at the man who was yelling at me, and she says, Sir, I got plenty of napkins. He gave me plenty of napkins. Let me share some of my napkins with you. See, here's what happens. When we choose to give, generosity breeds generosity. Generosity breeds generosity. When you're around people that are selfish, mine, 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 right? Like a little kid. No, I'm not going to share what I have. It, it, it breeds a sense of poverty and lack, kind of just making it all about what I need, what I want, what, what, what's mine is mine, and you can't have it. But when you start giving away time, generosity, money, help, serving, it starts changing someone's heart to want to be generous to the people around them. But selfishness, it, it really is rooted from pride. It's a pride thing that holds us back from giving people heaven, from showing people who Jesus is, what he's like this week. What if you decided you were going to let people get in front of you in that line at Starbucks? What if you decided you were going to serve people at Thanksgiving? Let them eat before you. Be the last one in line. What if you decided, I'm not going to be about me these holidays. I'm going to be about helping other people. I'm telling you, when we do that, not only do we give people heaven, but we experience heaven in our lives. When you give people heaven, you experience heaven in your own life. When you give people the opposite of heaven, you experience that opposite in your life. See, here's the thing about giving people what we think they deserve. Not only does it make them go through the pain and the misery of how we're treating them, it keeps us in a miserable, miserable place too. When you treat people the way that you think they deserve, rather than treating them the way that Jesus would treat them, it causes you to be rude and miserable on the inside too. We've got to choose to rise above that. Number two, the thing that holds us back from giving people heaven is a nothing to give mentality. Paul, I got nothing to give. I'm going through my own storm. I'm going through my own crisis. And usually the nothing to give mentality comes from two or three places. It comes from 
discouraging circumstances, you know, bad breaks have been happening in your life. Maybe there's tragedy that's happened in your family. Yesterday was the anniversary of when my father passed away five years ago. And you know what was funny is the whole day I wanted to just serve people. I wanted to love people because God's done a miracle in my life. See, sometimes we get to see the miracle and sometimes we get to be the miracle. When my father passed away, all I wanted to do was curl up and hide. Guys, I wanted to run away from here. I wanted to get as far away from church and God and family. I was angry on the inside. I, I was grieving. I was hurting. It was painful. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to handle it. And I remember my mom saying, guys, the best way to get through grief is serving other people, ministering to other people out of your own pain, out of when you feel like you've got nothing to give. What was mom doing? She was showing us how to give heaven, how to receive heaven in our own lives. You know what happened? As we started forcing ourselves to give, even when we didn't feel like we had nothing to give, the grief started turning to joy. The sadness and the isolation mentality started turning into just a, 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 it was like heaven was invading our family. Heaven was invading our lives. The peace that passes all understanding. I can't tell you why things happen the way they happen, but I can tell you this. There was a point where after it happened, I thought when I get to heaven, I'm going to have so many questions to ask God. Now, all I can think about when I get to heaven is just worshiping God, being with my dad, being with the loved ones that have gone on ahead of me, spending time with the Lord and my family. I'm not angry on the inside. Why? Because God healed my heart when I chose to give even when I didn't feel like I had anything to give. And someone might be here today. You're going through a tragedy in your family, a storm, a crisis, and you feel like just hiding, curling up, Saying, I got nothing to give. I can't even smile at people. I can't even offer an encouraging word. I need people to encourage me. The key to your breakthrough is giving out even when you feel like you have nothing to give. Because the truth is, you always have something to give when you have Jesus in your heart. You always have something to give. God always gives us an option, a choice. We have a choice. Whether we're going to put people through hell or whether we're going to give them heaven. Everybody say, give them heaven. Give them heaven. Give them heaven. Give them heaven. What are we going to give them? Heaven. Why would we give them heaven? Because when we give them heaven, we receive heaven in our lives. When we choose to show them the kindness of God. This uh, last month, my neighbor, her grandson took his life. And I was a friend of this grandson. He was 15 and played basketball with him in the street. Went to another church, but I would spend time just loving on them, loving on the family. And the grandma was just heartbroken, didn't understand. And the daughter of the grandma, single parent mom, she was heartbroken. Paul, I, I just don't get it. I was in the hospital with them, ministering to them. And it was so much pain, so much difficulty. No smiles in the room. It was just sadness. Don't understand. But you know, yesterday, two days ago, I was walking outside, and this mom had a smile on her face. She said, Paul, let me tell you what I did this week. She said, you know, it's been hard. It's been hard. And I told her, I said, what's most important now is to pour into his little brother, pour into that young son that's still here. Show him how much God loves him. Speak life to him. And the mom said, it was hard. It was hard. But this last week, Paul, I decided I was going to give my younger son heaven. I was going to show him the love of God. And I went to Jinx and I sat down with some of the middle school friends that were friends with my other son who's no longer here. And some of them were talking about how angry they were. Some of them were talking about how it was their fault. Some of them were trying to take the blame. And even one of them said on Facebook, I'll see you there in a few days. And she said, I was heartbroken and I had an option. I could either sit in my house and get bitter or I could decide to go out and get better. She said those words to me. She said, I think your dad said that to your grandma, his mom, one day after her husband had passed. She said, in my deepest, darkest, most lonely state, I decided I was going to go out and encourage those students. I sat down with that girl and I said, it's not your fault. God has a plan for your life. The best thing you can do is choose to love people, minister to people. She started preaching the love of Jesus to that girl and something changed in that girl's heart. All she needed was an encouraging person and it was exactly that person that made a difference in her life. What happened? She gave her heaven. And what happened? She had a heavenly encounter in her own life. 
She went from depression to a sense of purpose. That's a good place to say amen this morning. Some of y'all this morning, you're going to go from depression to a sense of purpose because of what God wants to do in your life. You're going to go from a sense of pain to a sense of, Lord, I thank you. I have a destiny to fulfill, and I'm going to walk in the joy of the Lord. Peter and John, in Acts chapter 3, they thought they had nothing to give. They were walking to the temple. We're going to church. We're a couple of ministers. We got nothing to give. This guy said, please give me something, alms, alms for the poor. And Peter and John, they said, silver and gold have I none, but what I do have. You always have something to give when you have Jesus. What I do have, I give to thee. Rise up and walk. See, in heaven, there's no sickness. Give them heaven this week by praying for their healing and health. Peter and John lifted up that man. And from that day on, that man was a walking, talking, miracle testimony. Guys, you always have something to give when you have Jesus. Number three, the thing that tries to hold us back from giving people heaven is that we think they deserve hell. Just saying it like I see it, there are some people that, that you just have such a frustration of bitterness with that you think, Paul, they don't deserve heaven. They deserve the opposite. They deserve my wrath, my fury. They deserve me treating them wrong. They deserve this grudge that I've been holding against them. You don't know. They don't, they don't respect me. They don't honor me. They, they've done things to me. They've hurt me. And guys, I'm not saying that what they've done is okay. But what I'm saying is as long as you're holding on to it, it's keeping you in prison. You think you're holding them in prison. You're holding yourself in prison as long as you're thinking that they deserve hell. And by the way, we all deserve hell, but by the grace of Jesus Christ, we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. See, when you realize that your sin is just as bad as someone else's sin, you realize, well, maybe I shouldn't treat them like that because God could treat me like that for what I've done to Him. My family could treat me like that for what I've done to them. You've got to choose to forgive and let it go. Here's what I want us to do today. I want us to think about, we know now what holds us back. And I, I'm sure we could think of lots of other things. But now I want to tell you how we're going to give people heaven this week. What are we going to do? Four ways that you can give heaven this week where you're at. And while you're thinking about it, turn to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Yeah, we make noise every time we, we turn in the word. I love, I love the culture of our church. We are such a word church. Come on, somebody. Keeping it about Jesus it's always only about Jesus. Romans 12 verse 9 says, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Romans 12 verse 9 says, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. I've heard the phrase, sometimes you got to fake it till you make it. And, you know, sometimes that is true at times. But I would rather use the word, sometimes you have to force yourself to get in the love of God, even when you don't feel like it. And that's different than being fake. That's being a, that's being a, a bigger person and deciding, you know what, I'm not going to let my boss get the best of me. Romans 12 goes on to say, overcome evil with good. Overcome evil with good. You know what he goes on to say here? Romans 12, let's just kind of look at this a little bit. Verse 10 Love each other with genuine affection. Take delight in honoring each other. Take delight in honoring each other. Let's go on to verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Wait a minute. We're not to get revenge on them. We're not to treat them like we think they deserve to be treated. No, no, Paul is quoting Jesus here. See, Jesus was the one who first said, what happens? When someone slaps you in the face turn the other cheek. If any church knows the, the, the illustration or example of this, it's our church. How many of y'all remember about nine years ago on a Sunday morning when our pastor was preaching and he was down there talking about God, doing an altar call. I think we have some video footage of this. We're going to show you some video footage of this. He was down there preaching. Can we show that? You ready? All right, go ahead. Let's show this video. A Sunday shocker, a preacher greeting parishioners when one of them flips out, punches him right in the face. Well, tonight the preacher is talking about the attack. 19 Inch News anchor Denise follow with the details. 
Tulsa, Oklahoma, a typical Sunday morning, folks gathering to worship, the Reverend greeting the crowd, when suddenly someone punches the preacher. The Reverend Billy Joe Doherty stunned. I didn't know him. Uh, first time that he had been there in our services. And when I was hit, I was wondering, did he hit me? And then he grabbed my coat, obviously, and pulled me back and swung that second time. Hit two times before people stepped in to stop the attack, pulling the preacher's attacker right off his feet, but it didn't end there. Obviously, he had had the problem before, and he hit two other people on the way out of the building, including a security officer. And so he had the issues. The Bloody, the Reverend Billy Joe Doherty didn't Thank let you, the brother. attack stop him. Instead, he got right Hallelujah. back up and finished his One sermon. When I stood up, it was important for me to forgive him as well as to lead the congregation in forgiving him and then praying for him. Denise Tafala, 19 Action News. Praise God. I'm grateful for the example of my dad. I'm grateful for his choice to forgive. Not every church can take, take gratitude that that would happen because some churches have said, if that happened to my pastor, he would punch him back. But I'm grateful for the example that dad's always set. You know, I remember... I was one time out at the apartment housing that we were doing crusade outreaches at. And we were going door to door, inviting people to come to these crusades our church was doing right here in Tulsa, out at uh, different government housing. And we were setting up tents and we were giving them the gospel and doing a kid service and doing an adult service. And somehow I got separated from my brother, from the rest of the group. And I was walking to one of the doors and before I tell you what happened, I got to tell you, it seemed like every week dad was talking about forgiveness to the point where it was like every altar call was about forgiveness because that was such a core value to his life. And that was a core value to Jesus's message. Jesus said, you can't enter into heaven if you're holding bitterness or a grudge or resentment towards someone in your life. He, Jesus was always talking about, even in the Lord's prayer, Lord, forgive us our debts as we forgive those who have debts against us. Lord, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. And so I was walking through this area, and it was getting dark. It was a Friday night. And all of a sudden, these three boys came up to me, and they started picking on me. I said, what are you doing here, cracker? They started saying mean stuff to me and putting me down. And I was holding my Adventure and Odyssey Bible. This was one of those kids' Bibles that has pictures in it. How many of y'all remember Adventures in Odyssey? A few of y'all, okay. It's the good old times. I'm just kidding. We're in the best days. Come on now. But I was holding that Bible, and this person slapped it out of my hand. He said, get out of here. We don't need you guys trying to come in here and do this stuff. Get out of here. And he pushed me in the mud. It had rained that day, and I remember falling in the mud, and I was so upset. But I had just seen the movie uh, Crossing the Switchblade. It was a story about Nikki Cruz and David Wilkerson. How many of y'all remember that movie? That was like the one PG-13 my parents allowed me to watch because it was a Christian movie. And, um, and it, was, it was pretty clean, by the way. It was in the bookstore. It was one of those that should have been rated G, but they wanted to get you to, you know, want to come to it. So anyways, long story short, the whole point of the movie was there's a moment where Nicky Cruz, he's a gang leader, and he hates this preacher, David Wilkerson. Keeps telling the preacher, get out of our neighborhood. We don't want you to come back. We'll kill you if you come back. And one time, Nicky Cruz pulls a switchblade on David Wilkerson. And he says, if you say God loves you one more time, I will cut you into a thousand pieces. And David Wilkerson looks back at Nikki Cruz, and he says, every piece will cry out, Jesus loves you. And I remember thinking about that when I was laying in the mud. And this kid, you know, it was a little bit different. He didn't have a switchblade. But he had pushed me down. And I could have gotten angry and upset and swung back at him. But I got back up. He pushed me down again. I didn't have a good comeback. But I just looked at him. I just wanted to show him the love of God. I wanted to show him that I wasn't going to retaliate. I wasn't going to try to react to that. And I remember picking up the Bible, dusting the mud off of it, getting the, the water off of it, going into the kids' service. And month after month, we continued to go back and show the love of God in those apartment crusades. You know, I don't know what happened to that young boy. But I do know this. Today, there's a girl that goes to our church and she was at one of those crusades at the same apartment complex where that boy was that told us to never come back. 
And she came and she gave her life to the Lord when she was just seven years old. This was 17 years ago. Today, she's serving in this church. She was an intern in our young adult ministry. Why? Because we chose we were going to give them heaven no matter what they were giving us. You've got to choose to be the bigger person. I want the keys to come up as we get ready to close. Four ways we're going to give heaven this week. Number one, give them heaven with your words. Give them heaven with your words. Speak life this week. Heaven is in the mouth. There's a battle for your mouth. Every week, hell wants to come out of your mouth. But heaven wants to come out of your mouth too. There's a battle in the supernatural realm over your mouth. Why? Because in the mouth is the power of life and death. Right? Moses said, I'm placing before you life or death. I'm calling heaven and earth to testify what you decide. But I'm telling you, choose life. Speak life. There's power when you speak. Here's the thing. Your mouth is like a transmission. It has a forward gear and a reverse gear. When you're speaking life, you're moving forward. When you start complaining, gossiping, slandering, talking bad about people, you start reversing your life backwards. You're taking yourself spiraling down into a hellish life. But when you start speaking life, even when you're going through the most difficult circumstances, you start spiraling up. You start helping other people spiral up. I heard a story about two men. They were in a hospital. Both older men, both dying. In their last few months left to live, they were placed in this room as roommates. One of them got to sit by the window. His bed was right by the window. The other one was in the corner. The one by the window, he was at least able to prop himself up to look out the window. The other one, he had to lay flat on his back. Couldn't even move. Just stuck there. He could talk, but he couldn't move. He would every day ask the man by the window, what's it look like out there? What, what's happening outside? Man by the window, he would tell him, oh, it's beautiful. There's a, there's a beautiful lake out there. There's couples walking around the lake holding hands. Birds are flying around. The trees are starting to change colors. He would describe each week what was happening outside. There, there's all kinds of beautiful things happening. The sky is beautiful. The clouds, they're big today. If you tell them about each day, it would, it would just make this other guy close his eyes and imagine what was happening because he couldn't look out the window. One day, that man died that was laying beside the window. The nurses came in and they began to switch the beds. They said, we're going to put you now by the window. He got to have the window. He was older than you and now you get to have the window. And So they were moving him by the window and he was confused. He was laying there flat, but he was able to turn his head and see the window faced a blank wall of another building that was connected to the hospital. He said, where's, where's the lake? The nurse said, what lake? He said, well, my roommate told me there was a lake, that there was park benches, and there was couples walking around, and there was birds, and you could see the sky. All I see is a blank wall. The nurse laughed. She said, your roommate was blind. She said, he just decided to encourage you. See, this man who was blind, he had a choice. He could speak negative, but the more that he spoke encouraging words, the more life it put in that other man in the room. He said, man, when he would describe what was outside, I felt like breath was coming back in my lungs. You have a choice every week to breathe life into people with the words you speak or to breathe death. This week, you might be sitting around the table and there might be discouraging negative things being spoken at the table. Maybe at your workplace. Maybe your boss says negative things. You can choose to rise above it and speak life. Invite heaven into the atmosphere with your words. Speak words of hope. Shut down slander. Shut down negative complaining. Choose to be the one that's got a positive perspective in the room. When you walk into the room, do people feel like hell just walked into the room? Or do people feel like heaven just showed up? Do they say, man, you're the biggest encourager in the room. You always are encouraging other people. I want to be known as someone that's encouraging other people, not someone that's always putting others down. When someone's sarcastic with you this week, instead of shooting back sarcastic remarks, what if you gave them an encouraging word? What if you stopped the sarcasm, stopped the, the name calling in your marriage and decided to be the bigger person and said, I'm going to speak life in this marriage. I'm going to speak life over our kids. My parents used to call us peaceful Paul and joyful John. I wasn't very peaceful and John wasn't very joyful. They could have called it like they saw it. They could have said, wild Paul and angry John. But what were they doing? They were speaking life instead of speaking what they saw. 
They were calling those things that were not as though they were. That's what we're called to do as believers. Number two, give them heaven this week with your kindness. With your kindness. Colossians 3 verse 12 says, Let us be clothed with kindness and humility. Let us show the kindness of Christ. Let us treat people with kindness. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 4 says, Love is patient. Love is kind. Kindness is such a rare quality these days in America. It's like everybody's too busy to be kind. Everybody's too trying to climb the ladder to success that they forget there's people around them that just need kindness. Just a gesture of kindness. What would it look like to be kind to your family this week? Maybe it's putting the phone down and just looking at your children. Maybe it's putting the phone down, kids, and just listening to your grandmother. Just spending some time. Maybe it's washing the dishes today after lunch instead of making your mom do it. All the moms just said, amen and amen. Maybe it's paying for somebody's coffee behind you. Maybe it's just showing a gesture of kindness where no one could repay you. Jesus was notorious for blessing people with kindness that could never repay him. He was notorious for helping people out. He was notorious for meeting people's needs and showing them the love of God. Everywhere Jesus went, he gave people heaven. Whether it was in Mark 5 when he showed up on another land and healed the demoniac, or the woman with the issue of blood that just touched him and he healed her, Or maybe it was with Peter, when Peter blew it and messed up, but Jesus said, I'm going to use you to build the church. See, Jesus was someone that always showed kindness. Number three, this week, give them heaven with your forgiveness. Give them heaven with your forgiveness. Joseph in the Bible was someone that had to do this. His brothers, man, they threw him in a pit. His brothers, they sold him as a slave. He was lied about, slandered, cheated. His dream was put on hold for years and years and years. If anyone had a reason to get bitter, it was Joseph. But he chose instead of cursing his brothers, instead of giving them what they gave him, he gave them heaven. He took care of them. He blessed them. He gave them food. He forgave them. And he said, what you meant for harm, God used for good. See, some of y'all in this room, you've gone through some bad things. You've been mistreated by people. Things that have been done to you have been unfair. But you can choose to either respond by giving them pain and suffering and misery and holding that grudge, or you can choose to respond by giving them heaven. When you give them heaven, you experience heaven on the inside. My uncle was walking out of Walmart one time, and someone was driving drunk through the parking lot, 40 miles an hour, ran him over. The paramedics showed up on the scene and they said, this man's not going to live. He's done. Praise God, Uncle David got through it. He lived. He's been worshiping here. He's been coming into church, lifting his hands, praising God. They told him he would never walk again. They told him he'd be a vegetable. Everything they told him, the opposite has happened. He is alive and well, which is one miracle. But I want to tell you about a different miracle that happened in that story. That, that happened two years ago. That actually had happened a year and a half ago. And about five months ago, I was in church. And I was praying for people down here at the altar. And this guy, he was sobbing. He was crying so hard. I said, what's going on? He said, man, God's working on my heart. I said, what's he doing? He's, he's washing away the pain and the shame of my sins and my addictions. He said, well, what have you been struggling with? I want to hear what God's done in your life. He said, man, I've been an alcoholic. I've gone to jail many times for driving drunk. He said, right now I'm facing potential prison time, serious time. He said, because I, I, I was driving one day and I was driving drunk and I ran over somebody. And when it happened, I, I jumped out of the car. I was so scared that I had killed him and I took off running. I, he said, I went to California. I was thinking, this story sounds way too familiar. He said, the cops caught up with me, and he said, right now, I'm, I'm scared. I'm scared. They're telling me at the next jury, the next time I go before the judge, they're going to decide whether I'll go to prison for many years or what's going to happen. Would you pray for me? I said, well, where did, where did you run over somebody? He said, right here in Tulsa. He said, right over there at that Walmart. 
This was the guy that ran over my uncle. My uncle had never seen his face. That night, my uncle and aunt were at church. And I walked back to him. I said, Uncle David, there's someone that I think you should see. I don't know if you want to see him. Uncle David was fine. He was worshiping God. He said, what are you talking about? I said, the guy who ran over you is at church tonight. And Uncle David's heart and Aunt Anne and they said, Paul, we're still in the middle of trying to sort out what's going to happen. But I was amazed at what, what they said. They said, Paul, we've decided already in our hearts we're going to forgive him. We're going to forgive him. Now, you might think, well, that's good. But you don't know what they've walked through because of that. Aunt Anne has had to help dress David every day, help get him back on his feet, help serve him. It's been a painful process as Uncle David's even been able to just finally start driving again. So the pain they've walked through, and in that moment to say, we decided in our hearts, just a week and a half ago, they went to the judge. It was the day that they would decide what was going to happen to Silas. Silas was standing there, and the judge said, well, David, what do you think we need to do? He was giving David the chance to decide what he was going to have done to Silas for running him over and almost killing him. David said, I want that boy out of prison. I want him serving God. I want him to know what he did was wrong. It was, it was terrible. But I want him to know I forgive him. I want him in church. I want him in the rehab program. I want him getting healed. I don't want that boy to have to pay for what he... And I'm telling you, in that moment, Silas broke down and cried. It was just an incredible moment where he could have held on to the debt of what that guy did to him. Now, I'm not saying that everybody can do this. But what God did in David's heart was a greater miracle than what happened to his life. It was a miracle that happened in our family. Choosing to forgive when we could hold on to the pain and the bitterness of what happened. Mom, am I telling it right? The whole story is true. That boy's coming to this church. God's done a work in his life. He's been going through the rehab program. He said, I'm never driving drunk again. I'm never going to be an alcoholic. I'm called to be a dad. I'm called to be a husband. See what David did. He granted him a pardon. And David thought he was setting him free, but he was setting himself free. When you give people heaven, you set yourself free from hell. When you choose to forgive those who've wronged you, who've hurt you. Maybe you're still holding on to something that someone did who's not even alive anymore. It's bad enough that they made you angry while they were here. They're in the grave and they're still beating you. It's time to let it go. It's time to forgive. It's time to give yourself a taste of heaven. Maybe you've been holding on to bitterness against yourself for what you did wrong to your daughter, to your son, what your dad did to you what your mom did to you. But I want to challenge you to give them heaven this week. Because when you give them heaven, you experience heaven in your life. Number four, give them heaven with your praise. Give them heaven with your praise. Job had a reason to get angry, to get frustrated, to complain, to, to sit in the ashes of his pain and his misery. But in Job chapter 19, he rose up and he said, my Redeemer, I know my Redeemer still lives and I will see him on the throne and I will see this thing turn around. What was Job doing? He was deciding to praise See, when things are going bad, it feels like it's getting darker and darker and darker. And I want it to just get dark in this room because some of you are going through a test, a trial. And it's like bad things keep happening. There's tragedy happening in your family. There's storms you're walking through. Lawsuits are coming against you. Pain is happening. And it feels like the light is getting further and further and further away. And you have a choice in the middle of the darkness. Are you going to praise or you're going to get angry and bitter? Are you going to get better in worship? Or are you going to get smaller and smaller with an attitude of anger and bitterness and strife and resentment? Paul and, Silas, Paul and Silas, they had a choice in the prison. In Acts 16, it says that while they were in the middle of, of locked up in chains in those prison cells, they begin to sing hymns to the Lord. They begin to praise the Lord. How great is our God! And as they begin to sing, something begin to rattle in the prison cells. How great is our God! 
Even in the darkness, I praise you, Lord. Give thanks in all things, Paul said. I will rejoice and be glad in him. I rejoice and say again, I rejoice. How great. And the louder they praised, the stronger their worship got. It says the prison doors flung open. The chains fell off. The prisoners were listening. And it says that they walked out of the prison that day. And the jailer, he, he didn't know what to do. But Paul and Silas, they gave them heaven. They gave them salvation. They said, sir, you need to know this wasn't us. This was a breakthrough in the supernatural realm. What we couldn't do in the natural, God did in the supernatural when we chose to praise him anyway. Choose to praise him anyway, no matter what you're going through. Choose to praise him anyway. Choose to give him thanks anyway.